The whole world is watching. The whole world is watching. I saw police beating demonstrators and National Guardsmen packed into military trucks so massive my brother remembered them as tanks. I didn't know, as the newscast jumped to Grant Park, that both my brother and my mother were there, she wearing high heels and the whole thing, Paul confirmed decades later, my brother Paul, and Mr. Harrison in a coat and tie. We would be stopped every 10 feet or so by a friendly pat on the arm, my mother told the oral historian, and people would say, I'm sure you haven't had tear gas before, and we'd say no, and they would give us wet handkerchiefs and tell us what to do and not to rub our eyes. We moved around for about two hours and never had the feeling we weren't wanted. In fact, we were thanked over and over again for being there. Her emphasis on the peacefulness of the crowd was important as it countered Mayor Daly's accusations of violence. Before I turn this over to my partners for a quick hello, a bit about tonight's featured guest. She is a professional at writing about families and history. These are two things that my organization cares about enormously. Honor Moore is the author of The Bishop's Daughter, a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, and The White Blackbird, a New York Times notable book, as well as three collections of poetry. She teaches in the MFA program at the New School in New York City, where she is right now. Her book, Our Revolution, was just published. It can be purchased through our partners at Porter Square Books and shipped to you for free, free of charge, rather, related for the shipping, related to this event, if you just mention the code AMINSP20, as in American Inspiration 20. If we were in person together, I'd be encouraging you to buy the book, so I'm encouraging you here too. You can call them or go online at portersquarebooks.com. Now, we have some other opening thoughts. We're very excited to be in partnership with the State Library of Massachusetts. Beth, are you? Thank you, Margaret, and hello, everyone. I'm Beth Carroll Harks, a head of special collections at the State Library of Massachusetts. Our own author talk series was curtailed this spring because of virus-related health concerns, so we're delighted. We're actually more than delighted to be able to collaborate with American Ancestors and EHGS and with the Public Library on tonight's program. So many of the individual and family names in our speaker's current book are very familiar to us because of our own collections in the State Library. So tonight we look forward to hearing about these people and a whole new context. So thank you and Kristen. Thank you, Beth. I'm Kristen Motti. I'm an adult programs librarian at the Boston Public Library in Copley Square, Boston, Massachusetts. So happy to be here tonight and thrilled with this collaboration. I just want to tell you about our special guest moderator tonight. I'll just take a moment for that, Claire Massoud. Claire Massoud is the multi-award winning author of six works of fiction, the delightfully titled Kant's Little Prussian Head and Other Reasons Why I Write an Autobiography and Essays. Her first work of nonfiction will be out in October. Claire, we hope that you'll come back and talk with us during our, during our series then. For now, I'd like to turn this over. Let's please welcome Honor Moore. Hi, I am so uh, happy to be here uh, in, Bo in Boston, um, which is one of my home places. Um, this book took me seven and a half years to write. I have to say that it was a little bit of a pang when it was published on March 10th, but actually these Zoom events have been just wonderful, and I'm thrilled to be here. Just to tell you a little about the book, um, my mother, who died in 1973 at the age of 50, had, after nine children, become a right nine children and a life as a bishop's wife, had become... Um, a writer and she published a book in 1968 and was on to the next book when she got cancer and died quite suddenly. I mean, it was six months, but it was quite suddenly. Um, and she left me unfinished writing, unfinished fiction, letters, um, you know, and it enlarged letters, diaries, journals, and of course, 
uh, 25 years of scrapbooks, which I later realized were uh, part of her narrative enterprise along with the nine children. Um, and um, what I've done with the book, I mean, I've written the book, but I've also been able to weave her writing through it. So when I read to you, I'll try and make it clear when she's talking. Um, but it's been an extraordinary experience to write the book. And it's been extraordinary because I, because these Zoom um, uh, events, you know, remain in the world, quote unquote, forever, whatever that means. I try to make each one different. And my mother keeps providing me uh, with experience, um, no matter what's going on in the world. You know, a pandemic is nine children all with the same cold, sort of. Um, but really, my mother did become an activist and that was sort of culminated in 1968. So the big question um, is how did this Boston sheltered uh, North Shore girl go from be riding horses and winning blue ribbons at the Myopia Hunt Club to being an activist, um, tear gassed on the streets of Chicago in 1968. We'll try to give you uh, a sense of that, but what I'm gonna show you now is a 90 second uh, video, which gives you a sense of the material that I had to work with. And the soundtrack is Vivaldi, one of my mother's favorite composers. I'm just always um, thrilled when I see that again. What I thought I'd do is I'm gonna read um, a little piece of, of the book that sort of gives you a sense of her as a young girl, young woman, and then Claire and I will talk. Um, decades after my mother died, her Vassar class invited me to speak at their 55th reunion. Pulling into the parking lot, I was struck by the old growth trees, the green of June against the gloomy red brick of the building to which I had been directed. I'm visualizing my mother at 17 as I enter the classroom, its fixtures still old fashioned. I find myself startled by how old my mother's classmates seem, about 20 women in their mid seventies, among them a few of their spouses. My mother would have been 76. But I'm thinking of the girl in Mr. Brooks's class, not the 76-year-old, not even the mother I knew. She signed up for English, history, Spanish, and French, courses that might have met in this classroom, where I now step to the lectern to read maybe poems about her or from The White Blackbird, my book about her mother, Margaret. And then I speak, I think, about women's education, about Jenny McCain's mother did not go to college. Oh, excuse me, how Jenny McCain's mother did not go to college and how important Vassar had been to her, how she often spoke of a Mr. Brooks who encouraged her writing. 
But I also tell the story of my first visit to the campus. It was the fall of 1969, and I'd come with fellow dropouts from Yale Drama School to observe a dress rehearsal of The Serpent by the Open Theater, an experimental take on the recent assassinations through the lens of the Book of Genesis. I remember intensity and actors miming the tongues of snakes, but more vividly, I remember a short conversation after the play. Some women in New York have started something called Women's Liberation, a small dark-haired woman said. We were sitting outdoors around a table smoking. She wasn't particularly a friend, so I'm not sure I would remember her at all if her announcement delivered with no fanfare had not changed the course of my life, sending me back to New York to seek out the new women's movement. There was a quiet chuckle among my mother's classmates when I finished the anecdote, a few responses and thank yous, but no one offered a particular memory of my mother as a girl or even of Mr. Brooks. Jenny turns 18 in March. It's her debutante year and enough of the tomboy is gone that she loves the dinners and dances in full swing when she gets home. How handsome all the boys have become, boys she hasn't seen since they were all children at Singing Beach. By July, she and her friend Ruthie Robb have fallen in with Bobby Potter and Paul Moore. Ruthie remembered she was always paired with Paul and that Jenny, the youngest and thrilled to be part of something, was definitely Potter's girl. The younger set, as they called themselves, were a quartet. Paul and Ruthie, the brassy ones, Jenny and Bobby, quieter. The thing with Potter, Jenny later wrote Paul, was that he was beautiful. Everything was beautiful that golden summer of 1941. The four of them dancing to Ruby Newman's orchestra at the Magnolia Casino drinking martinis and wandering down the long willow walk to the beach below Rock Marge, the big white Beaux-Arts mansion in Pride's Crossing that belonged to Paul's grandmother, ominous news of war just at the edge of consciousness. By the end of that summer, Paul was at his family's camp in the Adirondacks, his father teaching him to shoot a rifle before he left for basic training. The day after the annual Myopia Labor Day horse show, the Boston Globe Society page reported that Jenny, the dark-haired younger daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Q.A. Shaw McCain and a pretty debutante, was preparing to return to Poughkeepsie later that month to continue her studies at Vassar. But that is not what happened. No, that's um, not what happened. No, it's not what happened. <laughs> no. Hello, Honor. Thank you so much. It's, um, that was just wonderful. And that wonderful video, it's, it's just um, terrific. I, you, it, it, it's also, I, I'm reminded each time, you look so much like your mom. Right, you guys I, look so much I like know. Her. I mean, I always say I consider that a great compliment because, you know, I think she was a great beauty and I don't actually think that of myself. But... Uh, People always say that. They always say, oh, you look just like your mother. So I guess it's true. Well, well she, she, um, d she may have had a family resemblance physically with her mother, Margaret, but I wonder if you might set us in context. The, the fact is that she didn't, um, she didn't uh, uh, follow the trajectory that, that uh, might have been expected for her. She went somewhere completely different and ended up, as you as you said in your intro, as as an activist. Um, but but she came f she came from a, a, a home that was a simultaneously very traditional Boston Brahmin family. And on the other hand, your grandma was a, a piece of work. Well, she was a piece of work, and she did a lot of work. I mean, she modeled a working woman because she actually did paint. And even when she stopped painting, she always was drawing. I mean, the, the problem was that uh, she was really in the wrong life. I mean, she was a real artist and she was quite a, what we would now call a babe. And, uh, you know, she was a wild girl and her family in Wellesley were quite, uh, what my family always called stuffy. Um, and she had a kind of blue stocking sister who nevertheless never went to college. And Margaret 
though, did go to Florence to art school. So she did start, and she did go to boarding school, which was a big deal. So she did sort of start to break out. And so there was no objection to my mother going to college. It was just she happened to be the first woman in her family to go to college. Mm -hmm. And she was always a, a voracious student. And um, she, uh, as you know, started at Vassar. And then what happened was she got a kind of hysterical blindness at the end of the year at Vassar. And she took a year off and recovered and you know got to see again and then um the war started and she decided to go to barnard she moved to new york and and uh went to barnard and um when other people might have quit when they got married and never gone back she quit when she married and did go back and i there are actually photographs of her in a cap and gown with me on her hip Wow, wow. Phi, that Phi Beta Kappa. Fun. She graduated Phi Beta Kappa. She was always, you know, proud of Sam. So. Right. Your, your, your mom didn't do things by halves. And, and no. You, you are one of, you are the eldest of nine. Of nine. Of yes. Nine. And people always say, why so many children? And I have a few, I, you can't, you know, you can write this book and you can read everything she wrote and you can, you learn a lot about something someone, but you can't actually answer the question, why so many children? She did always win blue ribbons at horse shows, and it was the baby boom, and people were having five or six children, and there was plenty of money, so why not have nine? And she would say she loved having children, and she switched to natural childbirth with number five, and she, um, you know, she just uh, what was I, uh, else was I going to say? Oh, she said she, she also said she wanted a baseball team or a small orchestra. So, ha, ha, so ha. I, in, in a little while, I want to get, um, ask you a little bit about what that was like growing up. But, 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 but I think in, in terms of the trajectory of your mother from being essentially a debutante to, to, uh, uh, a radical, I, I mean, your grandmother was a, a radical in a different sense. She was a bohemian and an artist. Um, your mother was more scholarly, uh, but, but she was also a, a Christian, which, which is, I, I don't, I mean, your grandmother may have been. My mother, grandmother was a Catholic convert. Right. Why did you convert, Margaret? I had to do something that year to shock Boston, <laughs> was what she said. But it was also right. sort of a thing people did then. There were a lot of uh, Bostonian Catholic converts, or a significant number. Oh, I think but, it was at the time of Evelyn Waugh, probably around yes, the same time. Was, yeah. uh, it, was, it was a global It mode. was a thing. And okay. my theory about it is that it was a way those people had to access their inner lives. Hmm. that it there was no ther there wasn't therapy i mean uh, i mean there was therapy if you were crazy but there wasn't and even then who who knows what it was like but um it was a way to access her inner life and in fact uh you know my father had a very dramatic conversion when he was 16 and he did when she when they broke up you know it was like on again off again you can read all about it in the book i have their correspondence in there and i try to make it into quite what it was a quite dramatic story but uh he sort of said why don't you try going to church and she had go her she had had a catholic governess so she sort of had gone to catholic mass from time to time uh but uh so she went to this Episcopal church that he sent her to, and she sort of had an epiphany. I wouldn't say she didn't have sort of a Jesus is my savior kind of uh, conversion. It was more, oh, I get it. There is another dimension to life. And interestingly, in their letters, the whole um, diction of their uh, conversation changes. It becomes a way to access having a serious conversation mm -hmm. about um, life, serious right. conversations about life. And it was sort of natural. Uh, a lot of their generation wanted to do something after the war to make sure that another war like that never happened again. Right. And um, 
my parents uh, with a couple of uh, Epis other Episcopal priests um, went to downtown Jersey City and started an urban uh, mission parish, uh, which was also a kind of community center and and uh, very racially, uh, we would now say diverse, but largely um, African American and largely poor. And so this was quite um, this was quite a, another kind of conversion experience to really understanding have uh, living among people of another race, which neither of them had, and um, also another class and learning about poverty and it changed them it changed them and yeah. and it's also the that's also the context in which you spent much of your childhood right i mean by the time you yes i to i um it, we got to jersey city i was almost five years old uh we left and i was 11. so it was basically until i was you know a preteen <laughs> that that we lived there so it was quite a uh, background. I mean, it was quite a, um, what can I say? All I can say is that it was very strange to get to Indianapolis and have no black children in the neighborhood, no black children in my class and uh, a lot of racist talk. It was a shock. Right, and, and do you think, uh, I mean, you write about that in the book about the dramatic change from one parish to the next, how, how extreme that was. Um, and, and do you think that, that uh, I, I'm just, I'm curious about you as an activist, whether that's a moment when you came into some consciousness of, of yourself sort of at odds with a, with a, a hegemonic. Uh, I, I, I did, I did have a consciousness of being at odds, but I wanted to be accepted. And uh, a kind of traumatic experience of my childhood was sort of the first week in seventh grade, standing at the window trying to talk to this girl in my class. She looks out the window and there is one uh, black young boy running across the, um, you know, the playground out back. And she, uh, you know, she says, I can't believe, and she uses the N-word, and I am just so shocked I can't speak. Right. But I've always felt an enormous amount of guilt about not speaking up. But on the other hand, it was dangerous to speak up. And it was not until um, I was a junior in high school when a very extraordinary boy in my class uh, started, we, we started to have conversations, uh, it was called integrated, integrated conversations about race at our high school the summer uh, after our junior year. And, and uh, for his, his pains, uh, his, there was a cross burned in his family's front yard. So, you know, it was serious, serious. But um, I would say that my activism in terms of race picked up l much later when I realized I was one of the few white uh, young women among my group or who who knew black people so right. Right. Um, and, I mean I think I think one of the things that that is so striking for me uh, in the, in your amazing book it's an amazing book for those of you who haven't um, yet had the joy of reading it um, but but is is the intensity of the trajectory from that moment that you read from of your of your of your mother as a young college woman, you know, coming home for the summer um, on the North Shore, uh, you know, the gilded youth of, of Boston. Um, <clears throat> from there to to the book's close, where you yourself are are a little older than she was maybe in that moment. And um, both of you are feminist activists, political activists, um, you know, anti-racism, anti anti-war, all of many, you know, many causes, um, and, and um, both of you already creators and artists. And, and it's, a, it's a long way from, 
from um, you know heading to the singing be you know heading to singing beach with your right. with your pal or to a cocktail at, at the at the country club. It's really um, such a big distance, but it is for the country as well. I mean, I think that's it is for the individuals in your family, but it's also the the world um, the world in which there's a there's a line that I love. Um, Early on, when your parents had their first parish, I, th parish, I think you'd been, you were born in, in Lower Manhattan, and and um, meet Mr. and Mrs. Moore, the Christians. Mrs. Butler said, "This is Connie and Dick, the communists." And by <laughs> 1968, this was a joke. But right. in 1947, it, it was an unheard of. You know, it was a totally right. radical, strange moment for them. Right. Right. Yeah. And right. and and I and I wonder about um, if you might say something. A little bit about about your because you and your mom it was sometimes a tumultuous sometimes a little well yeah we we fought honor get your hair out of your face honor clean up your room but you know as with all passionate struggles they aren't necessarily about the subject uh, and I think that it was a kind of power struggle I also think that it was quite difficult for me as a little girl having a new sibling every two years. And I just always, you know, it's like I'm a little further away from my mother's lap every two years. Uh, and so one has to adjust. But, uh, and I didn't, you know, I couldn't sort of say, well, why are you having so many children? <laughs> you know, I mean, I couldn't say that. Um, because I love my brothers and sisters and I too was excited when another one came. But on the other hand, I felt the consequences of that. So, um, you know, uh, and I think sometimes I did fight with her about that. But, but, but in, in, a, in a strange way, it seems as though in your mature, as you grew up into a young adult, one of the things that you, you guys were able to connect over was, um, feminism and creativity, um, but those are two things. But um, d do, you, um, do you want to talk a little about how that, how that happened? How, well, how that um, she, uh, she read The Feminine Mystique in 1963 when it came out. And in 19, January of 64, we moved to Washington. That's moving nine children to Washington. That spring, 1964, she started writing a book at a neighbor's house across the street every morning for three hours. The neighbors were at work and their kids were in school and she would set up in their dining room. And um, the book was published in 1968. I mean, that is fast, uh, right? I mean, okay. Yeah. So, uh, and I always thought, I always thought that she suddenly became a writer. And then when I started writing this book, I saw that she had always been a writer. I mean, that the first poems, she's 10, first essay, she's like 10. And then she's, she's writing poems at 14 that are real poems. And then there's fiction all through college. And then the fiction shifts suddenly it shifts to this 2,000 page correspondence, courtship on paper with my father, and which is very lively. I mean, it's really a narrative of what the home front was for her and their particular group of people. And, and a, you have a sense of the impact of the war, which they never talked about later. Um, and um, anyway, then I see her sort of, you know, coming back to writing. And just at that very moment, I was, I took my first writing class at Harvard when I was a senior. I had started writing sort of junior year, maybe I was, and I had written poems and stuff in high school when I, and even a novel at 10. But I was, but I was, um, you know, I was sort of, oh, maybe I, I can be a writer too. And then and then she began to be so incredibly excited and supportive of my writing. She'd say, she'd come to my readings and uh, in my very first readings, you know, which were, you know, little puny readings, but she came and she was very supportive and that was very important. And then the, the sort of crowning gift of that was leaving me 
her unfinished writing, which was, of course, yes, that's great. But what about my writing? Am I supposed to finish her writing or do I get to do my own writing? And um, so that uh, the, the climax of that struggle was when people said, who had read The Bishop's Daughter, they'd say, gosh, your mother is really interesting. Why don't you write a book about her? And I, of course, had written about her right after she died. And then I realized that I was in my 20s then. Now I'm in my 70s. She died at 50, so she could be my daughter, kind of. She stayed at 50, and I'm like now this 75-year-old who has this 50-year-old daughter who died uh, before she could realize herself. And so there is this, I had fun in the book saying things like, uh, you know, when she she says she declares her, she puts her cards on the table with my father. And I said, don't do that again. Please don't do that again. And then I sort of talk about her, you know, one of her stories. And I talk about it as if I'm her teacher, because I do mm -hmm. teach writing. And um, so I had some fun with that. Um, but, it, but it's interesting because one, I mean, there are a couple of questions that I, um, one is, one is how your that I'm, I, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts. One is how your, uh, your experience of your mother evolved over the course of working on this, um, mm. book. Uh, you know, you, you, you spent, you said how many years? Seven. Seven, right. Um, but you've been in possession of these papers for, uh, 45 or something. Okay. Okay. So, so, um, first off, had you, had you spent time, much time with the papers, um, before you embarked on the project or had they been sort of locked up? In I way? had read them, but I, I, it's so peculiar. I wasn't ready to encounter her and this time I was. And so, you know, when she died, it was a tragedy. I mean, the first sentence of the book is, it was a catastrophe. It was a catastrophe and it was devastating. And there is all that research about how people just don't recover from their mother's deaths. And, you know, in some deep way, I didn't never recover from it. And so it was kind of surrounded by a tragic aura. But who I got to know in writing this book was this incredibly vigorous, uh, you know, assertive, sensitive, intelligent uh, woman. And um, so it, cha it changed her for me. I felt I had her back. One of my sisters said, I just love this book because I have my mother back. Mm -hmm. And it's as if um, I got her before she got sick. Mm -hmm. I got her back the way she, you know, with the whoops i I got her back the um how how she was when we were starting to be friends right. um, we were right. starting to be friends, and this was the continuation of the friendship, so it was a kind of thrilling i mean it was really, really hard work because weaving her writing and my writing and you know women's lives seem to have all these stages in them and it was this process of um, each time she went into a different stage of trying to figure out who she was and you know what was writing to her for her and what was having children for her and you know so uh, so so maybe this is actually a moment um, to uh, to move over into questions um, because. Because there are a lot of people who who have submitted questions both before and during the uh, during the discussion, and and there's one um, that actually seems to me to relate uh, really to where we you know what we've just been talking about, and we might start there. Um, and this is a question from Glenn, who, who I don't know if Glenn is a friend of yours. I'm asking how did the experience of writing this differ from the experience of writing the Bishop's Daughter? Um, what's the overlap between them and what was the difference between writing the two books? Well, my parents are very different people. Uh, that's one thing. Um, my father lived to be 83, so I did have a lifetime with him. My mother died at 50. I was 27. So that's two very different experiences. With my father, it, it had some of the same elements in terms of resolving an unresolved relationship. Uh, but 
you know, I'd had more of the relationship. Um, and my father was really a more, because he had secrets, he, it was really getting to, having to get to know a really different person than the person I'd known. So the project was to kind of, who is this person who had this hidden bisexual life? With my mother, there were no secrets like that. Uh, there was more that she hadn't revealed herself I mean, I never knew she had written poems as a little girl. Uh, there were jokes about her being a horseback rider, but I, I mean, there are many things in the, for instance, an amazing thing she did was when my father went to general seminary, she went to union seminary and mm -hmm. she took um, the course in, I can't remember what it's called, you can find it in the book, but the basic the theology course she took. And um, she also took a class which required her to go to churches all over the city and observe them. Mm. Uh, and so she had two serious theology school courses. And what I say is uh, she was trying to ordain herself. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think she uh, had any interest in being a pr priest. It wasn't, a woman priest was not a thing. Right, uh, right. But she had met this extraordinary woman, Dorothy Day, who was a kind of Catholic radical activist. And she was inspired by her and she was going to be a partner in the ministry in Jersey City. So uh, she was going to learn theology. Amazing. I had no idea of that. That's wonderful. Uh, was, it, was one book actually uh, harder to write than the other, or were they just differently difficult? Well, uh, I always say the bishop of writing the bishop's daughter was a kind of ecstatic experience because it was faster. I mean, it. I had been thinking about him and angry at him and talking to him and had therapy with him and, uh, 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 you know, um, for all these years, and so it sort of all came out. Uh, at this, I, I had, and he had just died. And with my mother, she had died 45 years earlier. And I, uh, I had to reconnect with her. And that really took a long time. And uh, so I would say this was really much harder. Uh, about the emotions, I, I seem to like to write out of intense emotions. So they, they both were intensely emotional, but... <laughs> Well, and, and it's part of the intensity which of the of the books, which is yeah. part of their great strength. So, yeah. um, so some more questions from uh, from the audience. Uh, one of our our uh, attendees is, has asked how uh, your stepmother uh, Brenda Hughes Campbell Eaglemore may have affected your life and your work or. Well, uh, she doesn't come into this book because she died in 1999, even before um, my father died. And I think that my mother affected her, her life. I think it was a little bit kind of like Rebecca. You know, I think it was a little difficult to her to follow Jenny Moore. Uh, and uh, that was a difficult uh, relationship. Um, she was... Um, a very poignant woman in a lot of ways, but very difficult to know. And I think it was very hard for her to come into a, f marry someone who had nine children. Mm -hmm. yes, I don't I think she asked anybody's advice about that, but if she had, they should have told her never not to do it. Right, well, it, it can't have been easy to find someone who would know from experience. That's true. <laughs> right? They might well, know about four or five. Right? right, I mean, maybe in Victorian times, maybe, but, mm -hmm. but but not more recently, such large families were not um, perhaps so common. Here's another question. What ways do you think um, the activism of you and your siblings um, may have affected your mother and her activism? Or well, I think we were all inspired by my mother's activism. I mean, my sister Marion tells a story of my mother's, there was this uh, Episcopal priest named Malcolm Boyd, who was a real activist in the, in the late 60s. And his thing was that Jesus was a radical. A and he wrote a book, Are You Running With Me, Jesus? And he, he, he came to Washington. He was going to the Pentagon to do a protest. And uh, 
uh, my mother said to, to Mary, well, Malcolm's going to the Pentagon to protest tomorrow. You want to go? And uh, Marion said, ah, I don't know. Sure. And my mother said, uh, well, you know, you might get arrested. <laughs> Marion said, no problem. <laughs> and they did get arrested. A, a lesson for now, right? A lesson yeah, for Yeah, a lesson for now. And I, actually, I've been thinking these past weeks of the Sunday after Martin Luther King was killed, there was a service at St. Stephen's uh, in Washington, uh, which was the part of town that had been really rioted through. And I'll never forget that march. You know, and it, it, I think it's a lot like some of what's been going on now. It's, um, it, 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 but it's wonderful that that was a moment for generations to come, come together as well as yes. um, races, yes. people of different races and different classes. And um, <clears throat> I think that's quite a part of what's been inspiring um, to, see, to see, you know, it's, I, I saw on Instagram today, <clears throat> I, saw, um, I, I saw it's an 86 year old man waving a sign saying, I demonstrated in the 60s so my grandchildren wouldn't have to, you know, um, <laughs> but, but why am I demonstrating again? You know, yeah, but yeah. I think the connections, uh, there are a lot of connections between that time. Uh, it's very similar and it's different. Um, too, yeah. I think. So um, I, there are a couple of people, actually several people have asked about your, your, your poetry and your, um, and your, uh, so, so somebody has asked, um, somebody who just finished reading your poetry, collection um, that uh, I, I guess it's an anthology from the women's movement asks which poems for poets or poets resonate most with um, with the women's movements of today but then others have asked about what what poems you may be working on at the moment moment I just drafted a poem I'm so excited I mean I've been I felt like my poetry has been this kind of absent lover i mean absent companion and i i i've been really tired because i'm also working on a feminist anthology for library of america and we're collecting the photographs and um um so i i actually drafted a poem by dictating it into my phone wow and um I think that's going to be interesting. I mean, because, you know, I used to always, you know, draft by hand. But somehow, at this point, when I haven't done it for so long, to be able to speak it made it happen. And, of course, I haven't looked at it. But I think it's a draft. I think it's a real draft. So I'm actually really excited. And I'm re I also... I... I have a friend named Emily Bernard, who's this wonderful uh, essayist, an African-American woman, and she sent me yesterday a draft of a new essay and sort of about now and children and friends. And I was a wreck weeping after reading it. And that's when I drafted the poem. And it was, I thought of that uh, phrase of uh, James Baldwin, another region of my mind. And I felt as if reading her opened another region of my mind to all this experience um, with uh, people of color in my life and uh, the experience of racism in my life that I really want to go into. So I'm knocking on wood because one should never really talk too much about what one's writing but i did feel this sense of opening and so i'm hoping that my summer will be a summer of writing poems that's fabulous thank you how exciting in in is there um so emily bernard is is an essayist rather than a poet but are there, are there any women poets you might um uh direct us to suggest that we read in this time that you think of as particularly uh, inspiring or, or, or well I from the past I would say read June Jordan mm -hmm. uh, uh, she was a great activist poet and also a great love poet and I would also say to read Jory Graham now who is always who has been writing about the environment but has a way of melding uh, politics and the personal 
mm-hmm. um, and the life of the earth in a really extraordinary way. Um, and there are people, and I want to read Jericho Brown's new book, The Tradition, which mm-hmm. just won the Pulitzer. Okay. I don't know that, I don't know that Jericho is counting as a woman poet yet. Oh, <laughs> I was just asked because the questions were about women's women. Oh, poets. women poets. Okay. Um, but I think we can let all poets, all poets come into the conversation. Well, um, I'm the woman poet. Yes. We, we want to read you. So you need, but, <laughs> but, but, but for us to have a new book of your poems, you, you need to get into, in, into the, the zone of, of literary retreat and, and exactly. And exactly. get them on first. First, they may come orally first, but we need them on paper. Or, or they'll, they'll paper. be on paper. Don't worry. Yes. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. So um, I, maybe maybe I'm just looking um, whether we have time for one or two more questions. Um, I think um, one question here is, and and maybe we'll have we'll see if we have time for one more after that. Um, have Have you done any family research beyond your uh, mother, father, and grandmother. Have you researched other? You mean from my own family? Yes. Uh, I, I would say I have done all. I mean, I've researched, I, I really know my mother's family. Um, I know a little about my father's family. Uh, but uh, I, I, for the white blackbird, I really learned uh, all the way back to England, the um, sergeants. So, so given that given that we are, I'm sure not by no means exclusively, but we are a Boston crowd. I wonder if you might, would you be able to give us a little sketch um, of of your mother's family? Well, I'll just mention the feminist, uh, a woman named Judith Sergeant Murray, who was. Um, she was the daughter of one of the Gloucester sergeants, and she married the man who brought universalism, the Universalist Church, to this country, whose name was John Murray. And um, she was painted by Copley, but she was all, and she was all, also a playwright, and she uh, she uh, published a feminist tract before Mary Wollstonecraft did. Wow. So she's a kind of, and she's in various anthologies of early American uh, feminists. Um, there were, uh, there was the, um, my great grandfather's brother was the youngest clipper ship captain ever. Wow. In the China trade. And um, then there was Hepzibah Swan, who was a great sort of real estate tycoon in Salem and I believe in Boston. Um, And her husband was locked up in prison in Paris for war profiteering. When was that? uh, During the uh, American Revolution and they freed everyone from St. Pelagy prison, but he refused to be freed because being to allow himself to be freed would have met, meant admitting guilt. I mean, admitting that he was guilty and he always proclaimed his innocence. And this is, you know, Boston families. So he was in, James Swan was in uh, prison in Paris and Hepzibah, the tycooness, uh, was uh, sending money to Horatio Hollis Honeywell, who was Margaret's grandfather, who was then a young man apprenticing, or we would now say interning, at a bank in Paris. And he was meant, and he brought uh, Mr. Swan his lunch, his fancy meals in the oh, San Pelagie Spinning. <laughs> to the other side of the family. I just love that. That's fabulous. And then there were, you know, there was someone in the Boston Tea Party and there, you know, and um, anyway, it's, it goes on and on. Well, I, I, I'm so sorry that we can't, we can't, look, I'm sorry that you're not going to write the books of I, all of these relatives. I did write a lot of that in the way. You wrote, it's yes, a lot of it is there, but I feel like what amazing stories, but, but um, this has been a fantastic conversation. Honor, thank you so much. I want to, I want to encourage 
everybody to, um, to, to buy and read Our Revolution uh, and also um, all of all of Honor's other books. And Margaret, um, hasn't this been great? I, I think it's Margaret, Margaret is back with us now. So I'm- I, I am so fascinated and I really appreciate you indulging the genealogists among us with um, <laughs> well. remarkable history, Honor. Um, we uh, we love hearing it, and uh, it's just fascinating. And it's it's really there are so many. I love that you said that your mother keeps speaking to you. That you know over and all of your relatives are so lucky that you've written this because they will continue to speak to all of them. Um, and what a wonderful book it is. Um, and I wish we could go on all evening. And I I want to go back <laughs> into your book and read it again. I've read it once, but I want to read it again. Um, it's really topical. Um, in this series, as many of you who've turned in before know, we are really interested in the topic of inspiration. Um, and we're interested, of course, in, um, in what inspires Honor and what inspired her mother, um, and, but also sort of what can inspire us, particularly in these sort of dark times. So um, Honor, we would love to have you read another chapter or another part, rather. Not a chapter, part. God. Not a chapter. Then we would be here on the We have but... dinner on the table. <laughs> um, and with inspiration in mind, and um, let's hear again from Honor Moore. So this is Chicago, uh, August 1968. Demonstrations began in Grant Park across from the Hilton on Tuesday night. On her way out to supper on Wednesday, my mother saw people in the lobby sniffling and holding handkerchiefs. This was something new. I remember running upstairs and saying, there's tear gas in the lobby. Later, she and Gil Harrison went into the park as they would every night until the end of the convention. Twice, I was reminded that I had no business with that crowd, that I was a mother, she told the McCarthy campaign oral historian. For others, the demonstrators might be hippies and yippies programmed from the outside, agitators, anarchists, but she had been working with young people all spring, and her own son, my brother Paul, was moving between the park and McGovern headquarters. Watching television in the Berkshires, I could make out the demonstrators' chant. The whole world is watching. The whole world is watching. I saw police beating demonstrators and National Guardsmen packed into military trucks so massive my brother remembered them as tanks. I didn't know, as the newscast jumped to Grant Park, that both my brother and my mother were there, she wearing high heels and the whole thing, Paul confirmed decades later, my brother Paul, and Mr. Harrison in a coat and tie. We would be stopped every 10 feet or so by a friendly pat on the arm, my mother told the oral historian, and people would say, I'm sure you haven't had tear gas before. And we'd say no, and they would give us wet handkerchiefs and tell us what to do and not to rub our eyes. We moved around for about two hours and never had the feeling we weren't wanted. In fact, we were thanked over and over again for being there. Her emphasis on the peacefulness of the crowd was important as it countered Mayor Daly's accusations of violence. Back at the hotel Thursday night, my mother went immediately to bed. She and my brother were flying out early the next morning. The campaign bedrooms were on the 23rd floor, hers without a view of the park. She slept fitfully, a rhythmic noise that was probably a train, weaving into a dream so vivid she kept waking, thinking there were troops or crowds running. And then she heard a girl screaming, threw on some clothes and ran out into the hall in her bare feet. You've got to take care of her. She's out of her head. You don't know what's been happening on the 15th floor. And then she saw Jean McCarthy with four or five people. The senator took the time to tell me what had been going on on the 15th floor. The police claiming beer cans had been thrown from the windows of McCarthy headquarters, raided the office suite and assaulted campaign workers. I did not go to the 15th floor because it fe I felt it was a place for doctors and press and not onlookers. But she saw the kids bloody and wounded. The room where they planned strategies for peace had become a temporary emergency room. What she saw there, she wrote, was the crowning blow. How was she to make sense of this? The ones who were clubbed, 
the ones who sang and marched were not so different from the ones who cut their hair and played politics, my brother said on the plane. I've yet to talk to anyone who is really bitter, my mother told the oral historian and quoted a Grant Park protesters. We lost, but I am not discouraged. I'm very hopeful. Martin Luther King's Riverside Church speech had broken the division between the civil rights movement, which had inspired so much of my mother's thinking and politics and the struggle to end the war in Vietnam. She had joined the insurgent presidential campaign that emerged from the terrible injustice and violence of that war, its urgency intensified by the murders of the two leaders who had fused the causes for social justice and for peace. She had seen black children beaten, and now she had seen white children beaten. I think what happened to my older children, she told the oral historian, and to my younger children in a different fashion was that we really began to think during the winter and spring and summer of 68 that the public and the private lives of people like ourselves who had become involved could be in a sense one. It's a very kind of feeling reaction, but it is the whole business of honesty, honesty and integrity and involvement and caring and not making the public and private different. In Chicago, she experienced the feelings of powerlessness that were a condition of life for the black and brown and poor people she had known in Chelsea, Jersey City and Indianapolis and whom she now knew in Washington. Like others in the struggle she had been part of, she was now living the interplay between two realities that just a year later came to be called the personal and the political. I certainly feel, she said to the oral historian, though it's difficult to articulate, to articulate that I am a different person. Thank you, Honor. Those words and the silence were very powerful and just what we needed for tonight. Thank you also to Claire. Um, we welcome you both anytime at the State Library. Besides being a beautiful space, we have a talented and dedicated staff. We have rich resources for the study of Massachusetts, including its people, its families, its businesses, its environment, and of course our own state government. So we look forward to having all of you visit us when we reopen. And we hope that soon, but we don't know yet. In the meantime, our URL is right there on your screen. And if you'd like a much faster way to get to us, just go to mass.gov slash LIB and it will take you right to our homepage. So thank you all. So back thank you. to Kristen. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Honor. And thank you, Claire, for that very engaging conversation. If you're interested in eBooks by either author, you can use your library card, bpl.org or visit your local public library. Thank you to NEHGS. Thank you to WGBH Forum Network. And thank you, Margaret, for being a partner in this um, series that we are collaborating on. Thank you all for attending. And Margaret, over to you. Thank you all very much, Claire, Honor, everyone, um, Beth, um, Lauren Joe behind the scenes, Courtney, it's so many people to thank. It's really a pleasure to be with you all on screen. Um, we at American Ancestors NEHGS, we also look forward to seeing all of you out there and helping you with whatever research you might be up to related to your family or another's. As Honor does, we all have fascinating relatives and the women among them are not so easy to track. During this COVID time, my 100 colleagues, our librarians and genealogists are hard at work. And they're hosting a Twitter chat tomorrow, Tuesday, June 9, on the topic of researching family ancestors. You can join them, follow them, ask them a question at hashtag our ancestors. If you miss that, visit us at AmericanAncestors.org or specifically at AmericanAncestors.org in slash inspire slash women a page we put together, including many free resources and videos just for tonight, because we've all been so inspired um, hearing these women's stories. 
Uh, at American Ancestors, we really love stories. And for many of us, books and authors are our very special treat. In that realm with the Boston Public Library, we'll be doing more of these author events for your enjoyment, for ours, and for the sake of keeping arts and culture alive when we can't gather in person. For now, though, we wish all of you out there a wonderful, inspirational evening, productive but safe, revolutionary yet compassion-filled days ahead. We will hope to see you on June 24th. Thank you all very much for joining us, and we wish you um, a great night. <laughs>